All right, but to close us out, let's kick it over to our interview with Mike Griffith from AJC's Dog Nation. Really appreciate the time here from Mike. Some really great stuff went all around the SEC. Spring meetings talk, Kirby Smart's extension, touched on uh, Arch Manning's recruitment. The way Mike lays it out, Texas, I mean, it's baffling that they're even in the race at this point, given where the Texas program is, where the Georgia program is, and everything those two schools have to offer, as well as, uh, you know, I thought of an interesting question mark for the Georgia Bulldogs. Everybody's penciling them in as the SEC East champs. What's something that could hold them back? Mike Griffith here lays it out for us. Well, we're pleased to once again be joined by Mike Griffith. You can give him a follow at Mike Griffith 32 and you know him as the AJC's Dog Nation Georgia beat writer. He's been named a National Beat Writer of the Year by the Football Association, uh, the, the Writers Association of America. Mike, thank you once again for joining the show. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, you bet, Michael. And not only are you a heck of a beat writer here, Mike, but... Hey, when they open SEC spring meetings and the Paul Feinbaum show comes right up, you were the first guest on on location, on the set. Uh, th that must have been a treat. I know you've been on the show a number of times, but uh, uh, what was that like being on the beach with Paul there? Yeah, well, you know, it's always interesting when you use Feinbaum show and, and John Telty of AL.com uh, was on as well, the columnist there. So, uh, look, there were a lot of issues, and, and I think Paul wanted to dive you know, headfirst into it, and I usually don't waste too many words when it comes to dealing with some of the league issues and, and some of my outtakes uh, on coaches and, and trends. And so I think it was more a matter of, um, you, know, you know, Paul just kind of wanting to get right into the issues right out of the gate because there are a lot of pressing issues right now. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't think they have the answers, but at the very least, I feel like Commissioner Sankey uh, put the media, as well as the presidents and ADs, uh, pointed in the right direction that this is going to have to go down uh, before these things evolve and are solved. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you've tackled this for Dog Nation. I'll put a link in the show notes to where people can follow along here. But what were your main takeaways from Destin at the uh, the latest SEC spring meetings? Well, the complexity of the NIL, and, and you know, Michael, I know some fans just, they, they don't want to hear anything about it. I understand that. You know, we're here to talk about sports and, and football and X's and O's and games and things like that, but the NIL has such an impact on the game and how these coaches have to manage their rosters and how college football is going to look, and you're going to see the changes as time goes by. Uh, it, it's going to have a little different look, feel, and sound to it. And so that's why we're all kind of wringing our hands over, my goodness, what's going to happen to college football is, you know, for the better or for the worse, we know there will be changes. So I think we got a better outline of the complexities of the NIL, which I would uh, sum up by saying, you know, the, the difference in state laws, um, you know, the different difference in how coaches and programs approach it and the complication now of the one-time transfer and how coaches now have to manage their rosters to the point where, you know, the, the 25 man signing class, they've, they've eliminated that limitation um, just because some programs didn't have enough kids. You know, you're, you're averaging about 20 kids per FBS program that are transferring. That's a really uh, alarming number. So that is what I would say about NIL. And then the other thing, which I think is a lot more digestible and fun to talk about, uh, yet still is frustrating in some respects, is the different schedule models, Michael. I know you've talked about the 3 6 and the 7 1. Mm hmm. Yeah, so where do you stand on the great scheduling debate in the SEC? Eight game, nine game, uh, what do you think uh, is the best model moving forward? Well, once again, frustrating because it's outside of the SEC's control. The 12-team the, the playoff is what we're waiting on. And, uh, you know, this alliance of the, you know, the Big Ten and the ACC and the Pac-12, they're blocking it. They're blocking it because they're concerned that the SEC would have too much a competitive disadvantage. Um, well, and so the SEC has to respond in kind. They have to say, you know what, if we go to a nine-game schedule, and Nick Saban said this, if you're playing nine SEC games, there's a pretty good chance you're going to play five teams of top 15 quality. That's a tough regular season compared to what the Big Ten or the ACC or the Big 12 or the Pac-12 is asked to do. So if you take on the nine-game schedule, you're putting the SEC at a competitive disadvantage for getting teams qualified for the four-team playoff. We saw in 2018, Georgia was one of the best four teams, did not go to the playoff. 
There's been 32 playoff teams since we've gone to this four-game format. None of them have had two losses or more. So there's the hesitation in the SEC expanding to the 3-6 model. Mm. And how badly, based on your knowledge, does Auburn, excuse me, does Georgia want to keep that Auburn game, which, which of course, they wouldn't be able to, to if we stay at the eight game and, and the seven and one model. Uh, is that a, a big concern there in Athens? Well, I mean, you ask the fans about it, and they certainly want to keep the game. I mean, Florida's the number one rivalry. Auburn is, is number two. I, it, they didn't vote on it. I mean, maybe we stick with this current model. Now, the downside of the current model is that the teams don't play each other, quote-unquote, often enough. Um, so now we're really kind of picking our poison. Would we rather go 10 years before Georgia plays at Texas A&M, or would you rather keep Auburn on your schedule every year? Um, you know, you, you can't have both as things stand until we get to the 12-game playoff, and then the 3-6 makes sense. The 3-6 model makes sense. Frankly, you know, rivalries to me are um, kind of phenomena of, of the time, right? Like right now, Michael, I would suggest to you that the Georgia-Alabama rivalry is, is more alive and well than probably any uh, maybe outside the Florida rivalry. You know, the, the Auburn rivalry, it's, it's kind of been dominated by one team. Uh, Auburn is swimming. It's kind of what's happened to the Tennessee-Alabama rivalry, and I've covered that on both sides when I was the Alabama beat writer. Uh, I remember, you know, how Alabama felt about it. Gene Stallings really treasured that rivalry more so than having to play Auburn every year. Uh, and, and times change, right? Now I don't know what Alabama fans really make of the Tennessee rivalry. I know there's a lot of um, older Tennessee fans that appreciate the Alabama rivalry, but at the same time, it, it's probably cost Tennessee uh, a, a trip or two to the SEC championship game uh, to have to play Alabama every year when, when other teams don't. It's put Tennessee at a tremendous competitive disadvantage compared to other teams in the East. Um, so do we keep the divisions and, and keep the schedule as is? Uh, do we go to the 7-1 seven, seven, model that you talked about? where you'd only have one opponent that you would play every year and rotate seven? Or do do you forge ahead with the 3-6 model and throw caution to the wind with the 14 playoff uh, and the folks on that committee to decide? Mm. Now, this may be a tough question to answer, Mike, because it's, uh, you know, a little bit of a hypothetical. But if we do go to the nine-game model, how do you anticipate Georgia – would handle their non-conference because it's it's interesting. Of course, they got the Georgia Tech game. Do you, do you think they'd want to keep that? And then I, I know you've written about this over at Dog Nation. Though they got an Oklahoma series, Texas, Clemson, Florida State, Ohio State. I mean, would they have to drop some of these games? Do you think if we went to a nine-game model? Well, they would for sure in 2026 because they've got four non-conference games scheduled. Mm-hmm. And if you have a nine-game conference schedule, that's 13. You're only allowed to have 12. So. Uh, you know, and then you get into the situation of do you, do you want to be playing 12 power five teams? You know, part of the reason you, you play a, a, an FCS or maybe a, a group of five teams is t- to get a little bit of a break uh, and to get some guys some playing time, some opportunities. That's how you develop depth. Uh, and you also help support those schools. Those schools rely on those paydays. So there's been uh, plenty good logic for why you would play one or two of those uh, cream puff games. Um, you know, rather than, again, trying to, you know, go through this incredible challenge of playing 12 power five teams. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, uh, you know, Clemson's over here, you know, waltzing and, you know, jogging backwards through a pretty watered down ACC or Ohio State with their talent disparity they have. I guess Michigan uh, finally won. Uh, I guess that's the first time in seven years that Harbaugh's beat them. But I, I don't know that I think that's going to become a common occurrence all of a sudden. And uh, Mark D'Antonio is no longer at Michigan State. They were able to contend. But, um, you know, I, I just think that the SEC has to be mindful of what's best for the conference. And, and winning championships, you know, 12 of the last 16 national champions, the last four in a row, uh, do you really want to mess with the formula that's led the SEC to that sort of dominance? Hmm. Now, something else you've been all over this at Dog Nation, Kirby Smart and his uh, contract extension – of course, just won the championship, so there's got to come some reward at the end of that. Uh, what's the latest on this? When do you expect this to, to kind of be announced, and, and what kind of figures are we looking at here for Kirby Smart? Yeah, I think you said the key word. When is it going to be announced? It's been decided on. Uh, we reported from the Georgia Spring meetings a couple of weeks ago. The board's pretty much decided on it. 
now it's a matter of crossing the, the T's and dotting the I's and, and when do they announce it? I, I would think uh, 10 years between 100 and 115 million uh, for Kirby Smart. I mean, it's crazy money. Um, you know, but at the same time, you look at what's happened for Georgia since Kirby's come along and, you know, certainly the commitment to facilities has, has been amped up. Uh, the recruiting has been the best in the country. Uh, you take a look at, you know, the success of the program. Georgia is the only program in the country uh, that's finished in the top seven the last five straight years. And, you know, this fall will be the fifth straight time, Michael, that Georgia has been a preseason top five. Uh, do you realize that Vince Dooley never had a preseason top five team? Um, so, you know, the expectations, the performances have never been higher. And so, you know, Kirby at 46 years old um, will be paid, you know, commensurate with that. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize, Mike, your, your colleague, Jeff Santel, I mean, he's the recruiting insider there for Dog Nation. But I had to ask you about five-star Arch Manning because that seems to be what every Bulldog fan wants to talk about. Uh, any thoughts on Arch Manning's recruitment and and, you know, I'm not going to ask you to, to make a prediction here, but certainly it looks like the Bulldogs are, are sitting pretty with uh, the nation's top prospect. They are. And, you know, they've been the leader for quite a while. And it almost looks like it's coming down to, to Georgia by default at this stage with Alabama having signed a, a, well, not signed, getting a commitment from another quarterback, pretty and one of the top quarterbacks in the country. And, you know, you look at Texas and, you know, Steve Sarkeesian has certainly uh, proven himself as an offensive mind, but, you know, managing a program is another deal. And, you know, I just, I just shake. I don't know how Texas lost to Kansas, Michael. I just, that should, that just should, that should never happen. I mean, I don't even know if they were even 500 last year. You're telling me uh, that they're not, you know, so how many 10 win seasons is Kansas, tennis or Texas had? It's just, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about that program and Steve Sarkeesian as a head coach. I mean, obviously Texas has the resources, uh, Austin is a, a fantastic city, um, you know, but if Arch Manning's goal is, is to, you know, and the family's goal is for Arch to be the greatest of the Mannings, uh, I, I think they'd like to see him win a championship. And, you know, Georgia proved, I mean, if, if they can win a championship with Stetson Bennett, uh, you know, my goodness, um, you know, uh, why wouldn't Arch Manning think he could go there and win multiple championships? Now, all that said, uh, it's never over until it's over. And, you know, Brian Kelly and LSU, uh, you know, they're going to put a stake in this as well now. Before this is over, I'm sure they have been making it. I'm sure they haven't stopped, um, you know, pursuing And Brian Kelly's a good coach. I, I don't know that LSU can get in this late. I think Florida tried, and um, I just I don't see that mix Manning and Florida. I just I think there's too much animosity between the family and, you know, family history and where, Billy, and where Billy's at right now, Billy Napier. Um, trying to get a lot done, fast, doing some good, laying some good groundwork. Uh, but right now, Georgia is the it program. I mean, you know, you just take a look at that offensive line and the, the defenses that Kirby's had and, you know, Todd Munkin with that pro-style offense. And I don't think Arch would be running the, the, the offense that Stetson's running, but JT Daniels showed you, um, you know, what this offense could be uh, when he finished uh, the 2020 season with the highest passer rating of uh, all the returning quarterbacks in the nation. Uh, you'd see more of that air raid, four or five widespread concept that JT was so um, efficient at, actually leaving Georgia as the um, career passing efficiency leader. Mm -hmm. All right, last thing for you, Mike. Really appreciate all your time. You know, you said it yourself, top five expectations, uh, and, you know, the sky's the limit for what this Georgia team can accomplish. What is the biggest question mark you have for the Bulldogs uh, heading into training camp? Leadership. You know, you lost 15 NFL draft picks and four former starters. Um, you know, you had 18 permanent captains last year, 18, one eight, and only four of those guys returned for, you know, 18, excuse me, 18 game captains and only four of those guys returned. Uh, I, I wonder about the leadership. I wonder about the leadership at the field level. I've seen it over and over. And, and Michael, you know this. All the coaches are going to tell you they've got good leadership. No, no, I've never heard a coach say, you know, I'm really worried about our team leadership. They never say it, but you, there's a vacuum here. And now it doesn't necessarily mean it can't be filled. I was covering Tennessee in 1998 when the guy by the name of Manning walked out the door, and, and Tennessee fans thought maybe they'd miss their window, and uh, old number 27 stepped up. There's never been another one like them. You know, they found that catalyst in, in that Hall of Famer Al Wilson. Um, you've got to have a catalyst 
in the huddle. I, I don't care whether it's basketball, baseball, football. You know, the coaches provide a framework. Um, they provide the development. But at the end of the day, and anybody that's played sports knows this, when you're out there in the field in the heat of battle, you've got to have that dude. You've got to have that guy um, that can keep everyone's emotions at a peak. Um, or guys, you, you've got to have the players that you know you can count on that you're never out of the game. And I, I'm just not sure who that's going to be for Georgia this year. I think last year there were multiple guys. Um, but I think if we're being honest about it, I think that that uh, there's there's still some questions as to uh, the, the the player leadership at field level um, when you put it under the magnifying glass, and that's something that can only be developed over time. It's not like Kirby can you know put a special patch on somebody's jersey and say, well, that's it, you're the captain, lead the way. It's got to be developed by the actions and the investment that these players make in the off season. All right, just some outstanding stuff from Mike Griffith. Give him a follow at Mike Griffith 32 and don't forget to check out all his work over at dognation.com. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate this. Yep, appreciate it, Michael. All right, so that's going to do it for today's episode of the show. Just want to say thanks again to Mike Griffith for joining the show. Really outstanding stuff. Always a treat to talk to Mike, one of the more knowledgeable guys in the SEC landscape. So uh, it's just an honor to have him on the show. We're scheduled to have another – I got one more guest lined up for the rest of the week, potentially two. And, again, I, I said I'm going to stop saying it, so I'm, I'm not counting on the big Tennessee homer to show up anytime soon. If he does, great. If not, you know, I'm not going to stop – I got to stop teasing this because I don't know when the hell it's going to happen. But hopefully we'll get Cousin Shane back on the line. But, <laughs> hey, at least you got me continuing to show up for you guys, and that's what I'm trying to do. I know it's the summer months, SEC football, we're under 90 days till the first Saturday action, less than 80-something uh, for the for Vanderbilt's kickoff on Saturday, and of course Tennessee and Missouri kickoff on Thursday, so it's right around the corner, so stay with us all summer long, we'll be here giving you the SEC content you guys deserve, but that's going to do it for this episode of the show, we'll catch you on the next one.